siinä heti 11. Eli tota, niin kuin tuossa se oli. Heti 11 jälkeen. Siinä on puolet. I think it's a good idea to come uh, as forward as possible because I think we don't, we are not going to fill the entire room, it seems. Uh, one of the problem is that uh, if you need electricity, there's not so many uh, sockets available here. So, but um, then you, otherwise uh, I would recommend uh, one of the front seats. So, yo, so we yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I think we should try to start in, within the schedule. Um, I would like to remind you that uh, this session is being video recorded and the, uh, uh, the recording will be available at some point, uh, point at the Inspire Conference website. So if you don't want to be shown in the video, um, maybe it's not a good idea to, uh, to uh, hang around at the front so much. But otherwise, if you don't have any objections, um, just uh, to let you know that the uh, video is being made uh, public. So, um, welcome all. Welcome to the Inspire Conference 2016. I'm glad to be the, we are the, uh, the, one of the first presenters this year. It's nice to be here. Um, and uh, it's going to be a very interesting workshop today. We have uh, two sessions which handle the same issue, so uh, all about the Inspire download services. So the first part, uh, starting from now until 10.30, uh, 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 you can see the presentation uh, line up here. So first a little introduction, then we have a uh, presentation about uh, SOS uh, download service uh, profile. Then we have, uh, um, after the quick interview of all the technologies, all the technical guidance stuff here, we have a uh, discussion period about the uh, Inspire guidance. So what are your comments? What's currently missing in the Inspire technical guidance? Uh, is there any problems uh, related to the uh, implementing rules, something that's still missing in the guidance and so on? 
And then uh, ending this session will be done by uh, Kathy Schleit about the uh, using WFS and SOS together. And the second session, after a half an hour's break in the same room here at 11 o'clock, we have a um, presentation about the, uh, the work of the web coverage service profile by Yari Reini. Then we have a um, um, presentation about um, implementation done at the Finnish Meteorological Office uh, Institute about uh, um, INSPIRE uh, compliant WFS and uh, WCS. That's very interesting to hear. We have uh, another case study about using WFS and SOS together uh, from, from France. And then we have a group discussion and a wrap up of the session. So there's plenty of time for discussion here today. So um, I encourage you to be active and, and think already before if you have some questions that you want to discuss about uh, Inspire Download Services or if you have anything um, along the route that uh, just make notes and, and we'll have a proper discussion in, in, in both sessions. Um, do you have any, anything to ask about the uh, schedule or any practical issues, matters? No? Okay. So I will start with the uh, quick overview of the, what's currently there in the Inspire download services. So uh, what kind of uh, technologies you can currently use and what's being uh, worked on currently. Uh, so for those who are not very, very familiar with the, what is uh, Inspire Download Service, uh, there's, a, there's a picture here that shows that there are a lot of these network services defined in the Inspire uh, scheme. So discover service with view service and, and download service. And they're all kind of connected with the use cases that at first you have to find the data sets and the services using discover service mostly. Um, then you use the view service uh, usually to check and verify that the data that you've actually found is relevant to your case. And then when you really need to work with the actual data, you use the download service to retrieve uh, the entire data set or extract a part of it uh, and use it and uh, whatever you need to do with it uh, in your use case. So today we are concentrating uh, just on the download service part for both sessions. Very quickly, there is a kind of two level of uh, Inspire requirements. First, the legal in, uh, requirements for the download services is uh, given in the, uh, this uh, um, regulation, uh, implementing rule uh, for the Inspire uh, download services. And it contains uh, uh, a list of mandatory operations which are on abstract level. So there are uh, basic operations which need to be implemented by all of the uh, different kinds of download services, get download service metadata, uh, get spatial data set operation, describe spatial data set operation, and link download service. And uh, uh, the implementation rule states that uh, when, uh, when applicable, um, you, you should provide direct access download service also. And for that direct access, there are two additional operations, get spatial object and describe uh, spatial object type. So these are uh, parts A and two, uh, A, uh, A and B, sorry, um, of this um, Annex 4, this implementing rule. And then there's part C, which, which describes the search criteria for one of these operations, which is the uh, get spatial object. So there's some of the mandatory re search required uh, re uh, criteria, sorry, 
required. If you implement this operation, you need to provide um, some of these uh, mandatory search criteria. So as, I've, as I already mentioned, these are on the abstract level. So to go from here into something that can be verified as uh, technical interoperability, there needs to be uh, further guidance on how to map these abstract re uh, requirements into uh, something that is a technical specification. And uh, that is called uh, technical guidance on uh, inspired download services. And um, the current official version, which is the 3.1 uh, from 2013, includes mapping for uh, uh, WFS and Atom uh, Plus open search. And this is be, has been, is being uh, in a process of being uh, extended uh, to cover also SOS and web coverage service. And we'll be hearing about both of them, SOS and web coverage service uh, uh, groups uh, here today. In this session, we will have the SOS uh, group report and in the second part, we have the web coverage service. So you will be getting the entire scope of all the technologies here. I'll just go very uh, br briefly through the Atom and the web feature service because these are not handled in other uh, presentations um, like you in that detail, probably. So um, for the Atom, and the open search, I'm just, this is a picture from the actual specification. This is very useful to have in, in your mind. So uh, the way the Atom is specified for the Inspire download service is that you have two levels of uh, Atom feeds for each of the service. You have the service level, and then for each of the data set, you have a, uh, another feed, which contains entries about the to, to ac actually access the data sets. And to provide uh, uh, some kind of interaction on top of this, uh, there's a requirement to implement an open search, uh, um, search API, so you can actually uh, use keywords and use data set identifiers, uh, CRS identifiers and language uh, to select the data set that you are interested in. And the data, uh, the open search operation also returns an Atom feed. So you are working both with the, with the open search to actually uh, create an Atom feed dynamically, and then you're using the Atom feed to actually access the data, which is usually uh, files. Um, so in, in most cases, those files are encoded in GML, depending on the data set uh, uh, specification, of course, uh, or the So the, the mapping of the operation for Atom and OpenSearch is, is the following. So the uh, get download service metadata is the, uh, the top level feed. Uh, get spatial data set is an OpenSearch query um, returning um, this uh, uh, Atom feed for the, for the data sets uh, that are matching with the query. Describe spatial data set is an, another open search query um, that, um, I'm sorry, the get spatial data set query, actually that can directly return um, the URL of the, de of the matching data set. And if that data set is in multiple parts, then you will get an atom feed which contains uh, the links all the, to all the parts. So the get spatial data set you do an open search query, and in most cases, when you just have one match, you will uh, get the file directly um, um, using an HTTP download. And the described spatial data set is an, it, uh, returns a data, uh, data set feed. So that is a feed that contains both the links to the, to the files and uh, to the metadata of those files. And the link download service is actually implemented pretty much the same way in all of these. So you need to provide uh, the uh, metadata description of the service 
uh, into the uh, Inspire Discovery service, and that's the way to to implement the link uh, download service. And this Atom and OpenSearch does not support uh, the uh, direct access uh, download. So if you choose this, you can only use the predefined um, mandatory operations, but uh, you can't um, extract such parts of the data sets that you, that you would like to have. You, in most cases, you have to download the entire data set and then uh, do the selection uh, on your own uh, systems. <clears throat> then we have the uh, web feature service mapping. So the same operation, abstract operations again. Um, the get uh, download service metadata is mapped to the get capabilities request of the web feature service. But you have to provide the language support, which is an extension to the OGC standards. Now the get spatial data set is the get feature operation in this um, mapping. Uh, but um, it is, uh, it's using a special uh, stored query. So you need to implement this stored query within your web feature service that is called get spatial data set. And uh, it, that you, um, and you can um, use uh, dataset identifier, um, CRS, which is the coordinate reference system identifier and language, as as a parameters for this stored query. So this is the um, predefined download service part. If you want to use Web Feature Service to to create a predefined um, download service. Um, you need to implement this uh, stored query in, in your web feature service. Uh, the describe spatial data set operation is also mapped to the get capabilities uh, document. So both the get download service metadata and the describe spatial data set are both mapped into the same operation within WFS. This in practice it means that you, you will need to have a separate endpoint for each of the data sets if you're using web feature service. There's a, actually, the, there is a specific requirement for that also in the, in the technical guidance. And the reason is this, that the mapping is created in this way that when you want to describe a spatial data set, you request the entire capabilities document of the service. And then the link download service is also, it's uh, mapped in the same way as in the Atom using the discovery service. Then if you want to uh, do uh, the direct access download service, um, then the get spatial object operation is mapped to the get feature uh, request, but at this time it's using an ad hoc query so you can choose what kind of uh, search uh, you want to uh, create uh, and you can filter the, uh, the data set to, to return only subset using uh, the filter encoding standard or some of the predefined queries in the web feature service standard like boundary box, which is a shorthand for that. And the described spatial object type is mapped to the uh, describe feature type operation of the web feature service. Uh, do you have any question at this point about the Atom and web feature service? This was just a very quick way to show, sorry, show, to show how the mapping is done from the abstract operations into uh, the specific, specific ones. I will just quick, like an introduction to, to the SOS and uh, web coverage service, I'll just show one slide for each, which shows that this is being ex uh, extended at this point. Uh, so there are two uh, uh, maintenance implementation group packages for this 7A for SOS and 7B for web coverage service based download services. And the uh, 
the intention in both is to provide something that is more usable and more uh, easily applicable to specific uh, kinds of data sets than the uh, ones uh, mentioned previously with the Atom and uh, Web Feature Service. So this uh, Web Coverage Service group has, has started a bit uh, later than the uh, SOS, but uh, they're both still working with the, uh, with the final approved, uh, to be approved uh, specification, I think. <laughs> but we, we will hear more about that in the, in the next presentation. So do you have any questions about this overview before I let uh, Simon uh, to, to talk about uh, SOS? Yes. Um, in practice, well, correct me if you, uh, you might disagree, but I, I think in practice the web feature service only defines uh, mm, a service endpoint, which is something that is return, returning a separate get capabilities document. And uh, it has, I think in most cases it also has separate URLs for get feature operation and all these other operations. So, um, and the, I think the only reason for this requirement is that otherwise there is, uh, there is no way to map the described spatial data set operations because it's mapped into the get capabilities document. Any other questions? Okay, I'll just uh, quickly sh switch the computers here. Thank you very much. Okay, so th this looks fine now. So uh, after the general introduction by Ilka into the uh, uh, field of Inspire Download Services, I would like to uh, focus on uh, a presentation about using the OGC Sense Observation Service, in short, SOS, as an observation service for, uh, as a download service for observation data. So data measured by sensors, maybe also citizen science, citizen observations. So different types of observation data. Um, I prepared this presentation together with Alex Kotsev. Uh, we are also referring to some work uh, done by Sylvain Grelet on the uh, yeah, real editing uh, work of the uh, technical guidance updates, of the proposed updates. Uh, so to start, um, I would like to give a gen quick introduction into the topic of sensor web enablement. Why do we deal with these sensor data in a specific way? So um, if you look at observation data, the uh, devices through which we acquire observation data may be very heterogeneous. Also the way uh, how observation data is stored there may be different types of databases, different strategies for archiving these data. So you are dealing with lots of different ways how to store observation data. And similar as for all uh, spatial data infrastructure activities, uh, you want to harmonize the access to these observation data sets by having common interfaces, common data formats. And now the idea of sensor web enablement is to have a common uh, layer on top of observation databases 
um, or even on top of sensor networks that abstract from the specific way how the data is handled and provide a common way to use this within applications. So uh, to illustrate this a bit, um, you may have uh, different uh, observation networks uh, marked here at the bottom at three instances and then you may have several clients accessing these networks and as long as you have uh, yeah, very specific interfaces, so different interfaces for each of these networks, you have a huge integration effort because for each pair of observation network and uh, data consumer you have to do some implementation work. To facilitate this, the idea is to go for a standardized approach, and that means uh, we are looking at the OGC uh, Sense Observation Service. It's an interface specification for downloading, accessing uh, observation data. Uh, you can compare this like WCS is for coverage data, uh, WFS for feature vector geometries, uh, the SOS is an interface for accessing the observation data and uh, corresponding metadata. Uh, this is complemented especially by OGC ISO observations and measurements, uh, which is then the data format. It's a GML application profile, and we are using this as a common uh, data model as well as uh, XML encoding for sharing, the X, uh, for sharing and transmitting the observation data itself. So SOS as the access interface, O and M as the data format which we are using. And using this approach, uh, it would be just sufficient if each data source uh, supports this SOS interface, uh, and then subsequently uh, every data consumer could rely on this interface, and as long as a new data source just supports this standard, uh, the uh, data clients can use it immediately. So that's a bit um, about the background. And uh, now uh, we uh, are going to see how this fits into Inspire. Um, there are several Inspire themes which refer to O&M and SOS. So in geology, uh, oceanographic geographical features and sea regions, atmospheric conditions, um, as well as meteorological geographical features, environmental monitoring facilities, that's one of the most obvious topics, and soil. All of these refer to, uh, in some, some one way or another, to O&M and SOS. In others, we have indirect references, for example, species distribution. So there's a relevance for these standards in Inspire. And, uh, okay. Uh, and now, uh, to illustrate a bit uh, how this link is, so we have here uh, a measurement station, which you consider as environmental monitoring facility. So describing this station itself, that's part of other uh, uh, specifications like uh, uh, GML application profiles or whatever. And on the other hand, uh, you have uh, the data measured by these stations, and that's not covered yet or was not covered. And for that purpose, you may use this OGC observations and measurement standard. There's already uh, some guidance out there, uh, uh, which has been revised in the past months by Sylvain Grillet. And uh, this is also one of the core aspects we are talking about today. So uh, you can use O&M and SOS for enhancing the provision of the environmental monitoring facilities also by the actual data measured by these uh, facilities. Okay, so um, to uh, uh, continue, so first um, a bit about the objectives of the work we did in this group. So the idea was to refine uh, the owned M and three guidelines. This was a document produced in 2011. Uh, since then, a lot has happened. Uh, for example, there were several implementations going on in different member states, which led to some experiences which uh, were contributed to this group. Um, there were some uh, uh, yeah, uh, inputs from other projects, organizations that applied sensor web technology, and the idea was also to restructure the existing technical guidance uh, to make it a bit 
easier to handle and also, for example, aligning it to the OGC modular specification style. So uh, that was one aspect. And uh, the other aspect is, uh, and that was missing until uh, now, is to uh, enhance the technical guidance on download services by describing how SOS can serve as an Inspire download service. So that will be an extension of the technical guidance. And then the third aspect is, um, besides the specification work, uh, also the provision of an, uh, a reference implementation of these uh, uh, activities. So that means that we can validate directly if the technical guidance proposals are really applicable in practice. So this was also tested in some uh, member state uh, scenarios. And then uh, having also something which we can hand out to the member states uh, to see uh, if they would like to implement this approach, they can immediately reuse the uh, developed open source solution. So um, the result of this work, first I will uh, give a quick look at the uh, specification results. Uh, that means there are two relevant documents. Uh, the status of these documents is that uh, there is a, uh, a draft which was uh, submitted to uh, yeah, uh, the MICT for getting a response from the member states uh, and um, perhaps Alex in the question answer session can give more details about that process. And um, so two core results are uh, the updated guidelines for the use of O&Ms, so observations and measurements and sensor web uh, enablement standards in INSPIRE. So that's an update of this existing document. And then a new module for the technical guidance on download services that covers the sense observation service. So let's start with the uh, O&M SWE guidelines. Uh, in this document, um, there's a quite uh, broad uh, uh, range of knowledge uh, uh, represented. So you can uh, get information about typical design patterns, how to apply O&M. Um, there's also information about specific O&M obs uh, uh, observation types relevant for Inspire. I will uh, show you some of these examples in a uh, couple of minutes. Um, and then also an um, O&M profile uh, for Inspire, as well as some recommendations on the service layer, which are then taken up again in the technical guidance for download services. So um, the, uh, 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 perhaps we can, uh, so that's a uh, 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 view ahead for the uh, download service. Uh, I will come to this in a bit more detail way uh, soon. So let's start with the observation types for Inspire. It may be a bit hard for uh, you to discover all details, but what I would like to show you is uh, that with the technical guidance uh, on O&M, you will get some uh, yeah, support to decide which of the Inspire observation types may be applicable in which situation. So we have, for example, uh, different types of observations you will um, have to deal with in, uh, in practical situations. So for example, point-based observations that may be uh, networks of weather stations, networks of air quality stations. And then you may de divide this into single point observations. So one single observation station, which is measuring some something or measuring something at multiple stations at the same time. So Based on this, there are different types. At a single station, we may also have time series uh, uh, observations. That means at a single station, we are continuously measuring a certain phenomenon to get information about uh, a certain uh, air quality parameter or whatever. So that's for uh, stationary sensors. Uh, then uh, there are many use cases where we are also dealing with mobile sensors moving in some kind of way. And for that, uh, we have called it trajectory-based observations. And that's, on the one hand, maybe vertical uh, uh, movements. That could be profiles. You are measuring something along a borehole into the ground or uh, third parameters uh, into the uh, uh, height in different air quality parameters at diff different heights, for example. So profile measurements. Or the platform may be moving around, so that could be research vessels in the ocean's uh, domain, and then you would have a classical trajectory observation. Uh, besides this, 
uh, there are other observation types like grid-based uh, observations or specimen-based. Specimen-based, you are taking a sample, analyze it somewhere, and then you get the result uh, not directly at the location where you are taking, taking the sample. So to illustrate a bit uh, how these observation uh, types are, these observations are structured, uh, you can see here uh, you have one observation and each observation has different properties. So each observation belongs to a certain feature, which is the geospatial reference. You will later on also uh, uh, see a presentation on how to link uh, features coming perhaps from a web feature service to such uh, uh, O&M based sensor data. Uh, you have a property, which is the parameter you are observing, for example, uh, ozone concentration. An observation has a procedure. Procedure is basically the measurement process which was used to generate the observation. Could be a sensor, could be some kind of calculation that you are doing, and you have a result which are the values uh, associated also with the timestamp which belongs to the observation. So that's the basic structure. And from that, different observation types are derived. Um, I've introduced them already in the diagram before, so most important are point observations, profiles or trajectories. These last uh, two are also uh, uh, relevant. However, uh, our focus of the work here uh, I'm presenting today and also some of, some of the validations that we did was on the first ones. Um, so that's uh, uh, the basic structure of this, uh, or how to use O&M in the context of Inspire. And then uh, there are some uh, other uh, yeah, uh, things that were defined as some kind of O&M profile for Inspire. And that covers, for example, uh, how to uh, describe the feature of interest, so the uh, uh, location where measurement was taken, where we are using a certain feature type uh, for. Uh, also for the procedure, we make some assumptions so that procedures shall, shall be sensor types, not instances, uh, in order to uh, make it a bit more efficient while and sensor instances would be something which can be then handled later on by the Inspire monitoring facility specification. Um, other aspects com comprise, for example, uh, to uh, yeah, link what exactly what I said, how to link environmental monitoring facilities to observations and how to have some nicer uh, interactions and discovery features beyond them. And then we go to the service layer and there we have the link to the technical guidance document on the uh, ZOS as an Inspire download service. Uh, there are two uh, things which are of special relevance here. So. Um, within Inspire, we are, uh, have included the so-called Get Data Availability operation, which is part of an OGC uh, best practice on uh, hydrological applications. However, after doing some discussions in the community, it became quite obvious that this operation is really useful, uh, not only for hydrology, so we included this also in a more general way. And uh, also some consideration of more efficient data representations, for example, hierarchical offerings, which means that you have some further ways how to group your data sets that, uh, that you are offering through an SOS server. Um, beyond these uh, uh, more general functional extensions, uh, there are also some basic uh, things you have to consider when using the SOS as an Inspire download service. Uh, for example, um, uh, how to map the Inspire terminology to the SOS operations. You will get an uh, overview about this uh, uh, on the next slide. And uh, uh, having certain uh, yeah, uh, uh, rules on how to handle observation identifiers, how to describe sensors, etc. So uh, the most interesting thing about this specification may be the explanation how SOS can act as an Inspire download service. And what you can see here is um, there are two ways for downloading data in Inspire. So you have predefined access download uh, to data. That means you are accessing complete data sets without subsetting. It's uh, uh, just downloading the whole data set. That can be covered by the SOS in the core, so the get spatial data set. So 
get observation operation. With get observation, you can download complete data sets from, from an SOS server, so you can cover this. Getting the necessary metadata about the download service and describing the spatial data set. For that, we have the get capabilities operation of the SOS, which already offers sufficient information and a link download service that can be handled by current catalog services. And the nice thing about SOS is, uh, as soon as you have set up uh, the SOS pro for predefined access download, you immediately also have the direct access download, which allows subsetting of data sets. So get spatial object uh, can be handled through get observation because you have all opportunities to set certain filters and uh, query parameters to exact, ex access exactly only those data that you are, are want to access. So uh, if you do one, you immediately, immediately cover both aspects of download services. That's quite nice. Um, so a couple of further uh, uh, mappings. Uh, we have observation offerings, which are some uh, uh, element of the SOS specification for grouping observations. Uh, this can be mapped to the spatial data set within Inspire. The observations are our spatial objects. And the observation types, of course, are the spatial object types. So it fits quite nicely into the Inspire terminology how to use the SOS. And then there were some further enhancements, like uh, the additional, oops, uh, like additional metadata about coordinate reference systems, about multi-language support, um, and for that, uh, additional query parameters were introduced into the SOS specification for having the CRS and language uh, as a, a dedicated query parameters as well as metadata about these parameters in the uh, capabilities response. And then finally, um, this was complemented by an implementation that we did at 50 to not. And in this case, we have uh, added some of the uh, specific uh, observation types for Inspire into our uh, implementation, like point time series, multi-point profile and trajectory observations, uh, and as well as all the other extensions required for making the SOS a compliant, uh, Inspire compliant download service were included in this uh, work. <laughs> so it's available uh, as open source software. Uh, you can copy the link, so I guess the slides will be uh, available after uh, the conference so that you can also follow this up. And um, yeah, uh, as soon as the uh, technical guidance is approved, you can use the SOS as a download service. And in fact, uh, the current version is already uh, available as a development uh, version. And with this, I would like to close and uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions for Simon? I think there was a one question already about the, uh, the schedule of the uh, SOS profile or the download service. Maybe, Alexi, you can comment on that. So yes, basically the, the whole process uh, uh, within the MIG, MIG is maintenance and implementation group in Inspire, which is split into two parts. Uh, one is MIG T, which stands for the uh, technical uh, uh, group, and there is MIG P, which is more dealing with uh, the policy uh, that I mentioned and how uh, data can be used uh, for policy making uh, purposes. So, so the process is what, what we did was uh, uh, within the subgroup uh, with, with the help of our uh, editor Sylvain uh, Grelay, we, we, we did uh, this update of the technical guidance but in order for them to become uh, uh, an approved uh, uh, Inspire uh, technical uh, guidance they had to be submitted to the MIG uh, for a review uh, which happened, uh, the deadline was just uh, last uh, Friday. Uh, the result for the SOS guidance is that uh, we have uh, uh, um, 17 uh, uh, out of uh, uh, 28 uh, yes, and we have some uh, uh, really valuable um, uh, comments that we need to consolidate. We're going to uh, update uh, the guidance documents uh, in accordance with uh, those uh, comments, and then they will become a uh, 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 final approved uh, uh, technical guidance uh, document. So this is basically how the whole uh, process uh, uh, with the MIG-T uh, works. Thank you, Alex.
Any other questions uh, for Simon or about the SOS and Inspire download services? Yes, please. If you have one sample which gives many values, like the uh, geochemistry sample, which one is preferred to use? To be used. So at the moment, I would say the point observation may be the way to go uh, with a complex result <coughs> value. But um, for that, it would be good to look at the real data to give a, uh, the best recommendation. But for now, I would go for the point observation with a complex result. Uh, we did uh, 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 a try at the, uh, the point data, and uh, the way we read the technical guidelines, we had to make one point for each value of the same sample, and it felt kind of, you have a lot mm. of data, and it's just the same point. Mm. But uh, Perhaps I can give the word to Sylvain, because he wrote the... Uh, 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 technical guidance, and he sits directly behind you. So if you give the <laughs> mic to him. <laughs> Hello. Uh, okay, that's an easy sentence. It depends on your use cases because it's all, it could be valuable to have one observation per result because at some point, actually we're trying that at BRGM for groundwater quality chemistry, geochemistry. And we decided to go for one observation per result because in the w validation workflow process, uh, there is an interest to keep uh, the unique identifier of each observation because attached to the result you get a uh, quality uh, type of uh, information as well. So in all use cases, we go for one observation, one result, uh, per, per result, sorry, instead of complex. But I know that I have uh, colleagues in a more biodiff stuff that where there is this uh, kind of constellation of observations to try to go for more what Simon mentioned, complex result. Does that answer your question? Yes. Good. I was wondering why there is reference to gridded data in a sensor observation service. I, I thought it was coverages. So why gridded data in that service? Perhaps uh, in this case, uh Again, Silva. <laughs> uh, you mean like in the decision tree, w uh, the, yeah. the entire decision tree. So the idea was uh, to start from the beginning of the decision tree, and there is a sentence accompanying the tree, of course, saying, if you are in that use case, please go into a grid data stuff and linking to the other document, just for the sake of interlinking the, the two words and the two documents. Because we, we had the feedback from member states saying, Okay, uh, I was redirected. I'm an engineer. I was re redirected to this D2.9 document, but I'm, I don't find the title of data sets I'm looking for, of course, because those guys were for more coverage stuff. So that's why we added this tiny entry at the, at the beginning of the decision tree, just for that. Other questions? We still have time for, I think, one or two. Do you have a um, successful example of implementation of SOS with many and large data sets? Yes. So um, there are some, uh, uh, w uh, yeah, some scenarios we are dealing with. So in hydrology, uh, we are working, for example, together with BRGM to enable their really large uh, hydrological databases. Uh, we have also done implementation with air quality databases. Uh, which, which co uh, contain yeah, uh, air quality data from national monitoring grids. And we have also been dealing uh, with uh, applications in the marine community where we have also large databases containing, um, for example, data collected by research vessels. So it was really validated in these uh, real uh, situations. And several of these SOS installations are also in operational use already. Can we access them? Sorry? Can we access them? Yes. Uh, so uh, some of them are collected, I guess, in the wiki of the uh, working group. If not, just drop us an email, and we can send you some links to access these servers. Any 
Any other questions? I have just a quick question about the uh, the mapping of the uh, of the abstract um, operations. So, do you also think that the uh, one endpoint, like the one capabilities document per uh, data set, ma uh, applies to SOS as it does to web feature service? Uh, because the mapping is to the get capabilities document in mm -hmm. both. So you can have one SOS instances, uh, instance for multiple data sets. So we have this offering uh, concept within the SOS, and that allows you to offer multiple data sets with just one service instance. But be, you can't filter the get capabilities operation based on data set, right? So the get capabilities returns all the offerings. Yes, it returns all the offerings. However, we have decided if you uh, would like to have a more compact representation, you can introduce some kind of hierarchical uh, of, uh, offering uh, structure. That means you can have a water offering and that is subdivided into uh, more detailed information then. But it, so there is no such uh, explicit requirements for like in the web feature service but you still have the mapping, same ma kind of mapping. I think that might be something that we need to look into, whether that makes sense. Um, if I remember well, the uh, described special data set operation, the abstract one in the regulation of the network services, foresees a, a parameter uh, that then would specify which special data set you want a description of. Mm. How can you implement that when you have multiple mm, special data sets? Uh, I would have to look a bit more detailed into the specification document, but in general, um, you can, uh, yes, we have, perhaps the map, map to the get data availability operation for get more information about certain offerings. So that would be uh, one approach to fulfill this requirement. So, uh, actually the challenge here with the data set uh, that, that we faced was due to the fact that uh, in the SOS specification the concept of a data set is not really well established. It's dealing with observations. So the beauty of it is when you are able to interact with the actual data selecting a particular bounding box or a particular set of, uh, of observed properties and so on. So what we did was uh, we mapped to the, the, the offering parameter to be able to, to, to do that, uh, fully realizing that there are certain challenges, for instance, having capabilities, responses, which are gigantic. That's why we thought of really doing this hierarchy to kind of hide the whole complexity, the gigantic set uh, uh, of offerings behind something to not uh, have to uh, ask the user to wait for 15 minutes to get uh, the, the re response. So we, we try to approach it in a pragmatic uh, manner, but, but uh, how good is it? Well, of course, it would depend on the use case, on, on the, the, the actual uh, planning, on the data that is to be served, uh, and uh, uh, so on. So there's no one universal uh, solution, unfortunately, to, to serve uh, all possible use cases, for good or bad. Any other questions about the SOS before we move into more general discussion about the existing download services and some kind of gap analysis maybe, or if you have any questions about how all this fits together and which whether they, there are some problems with the current uh, guidance, for example. Now the questions for Simon. Thank you. Okay, so um, my idea for this, we have now about 10 minutes or 15 minutes to discuss uh, now you've had a, some kind of overview of the of what's available. So you have uh, Atom Open Search, you have Web Feature Service, and the SOS is uh, is coming. Web Coverage Service is coming. Um, do you have any um, general ideas on on how easy 
it is for the data provider or the solution providers to actually take what is in the technical guidance, what is in the implementation rules, and make an, a compliant uh, Inspire services. So do you think that um, you have any, it's easy to use the current uh, guidance or are there any, any problems, any, anything that is not so easy to, to take and to use currently? Um, just feel free, free to, to comment on that. Or if you have any specific issues with the current guidance. Like the, uh, would you like to have the, uh, the new parts for the SOS and web coverage service included in the same technical guidance document, for example? Or would you like to have them separately as different documents? Yeah. It's not uh, really a question, but um, but more a comment. Uh, uh, in the la in the last couple of months, we discussed extensively the structure of those mm -hmm. uh, documents in, in both uh, WCS and SOS groups, and uh, it was within those two subgroups decided that we would like to go for splitting the technical guidance mm -hmm. documentation. Why? Because, uh, as you mentioned, there are new solutions coming. Uh, that there is a rapidly developing field. Probably we have to discuss JSON. Probably we have to discuss PubSub uh, at a certain moment, sooner rather than later. So, at a certain moment, uh, those documents become a monster. So, we, we thought uh, we, we did the addition of SOS, which we already had. We arrived at something like 140 pages. Then when we split, it's a lot manageable. If we assume that uh, most providers would go for a particular solution, so those dealing with observations would want to only deal with the uh, SOS bit. Same thing for WCS. We thought that for pragmatic reasons, it would be nicer to have them uh, split. Uh, of course, uh, maybe losing something in the process because the whole picture is not, uh, it's not a consistent uh, one document. But still, uh, we, we did this split and we have the mappings that you mentioned for, for each of the types of solutions up front in each of the documents and then the specific bits dealing with predefined and uh, by direct access. Roughly 35 uh, to 40 pages uh, per uh, document. I would be very interested also to, to get some feedback. If any of you has, got, uh, uh, ha has uh, worked with the documents, are they readable, are they useful, what actually needs to be done? First of all, in terms of uh, readability, but second, is there something, uh, so some technology that you would like to see uh, captured inside, extension in a particular uh, direction? That would be very much welcome for us to know so that uh, we, we can think how to better uh, support. That's one. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I think uh, a lot of us today here are uh, implementing the WFS services or, or, or different kind of services using some kind of already created tools like uh, uh, programs and so, and so on and so on. And the result is services. And uh, then you try to validate them. And when you validate them, then you see some problems. And when you see some problems, you want to have relations with specification. And some, for example, if you use <coughs> Inspire Validator 2 for WFS, it's, sometimes it's really good when you have a problem and there is a, like a link to the, the part of specification where, it does, where this problem is written. But in most cases, you have link to specification. And, and the specification is quite big document. And the um, uh, uh, interpretation of the specification is also s not so uh, convenient to what we uh, uh, imagine, what the program creator 
uh, imagination is and what uh, uh, specification creator <laughs> imagination is. So it's, it was really helpful if the validator two or maybe validator three will have a direct link to the specification point where this case is written because uh, when we have the result of the services, we have, we have a lot of problem with dealing with uh, uh, project partners which implement the services, but because he is like saying, yeah, we implement this rule and the validator says that this rule is not implemented and so how to, to, how, how to manage this, this was really a problem. So my suggestion is to improve validator because it's one of the key points where you can actually test your solution and, and, and find what, what, what is good, what is not good. Just a quick answer and then, oh, okay, you can. Yeah. Just gotcha. a quick, quick response to Alex is do we, I, I'm very much for having the individual documents. Do we have in them somewhere an overview of all of it? That people don't find the WFS document and say this is the end of the world. It would be nice to have an introductory chapter saying this is the palette of possible services you can use. These are the areas which, which one would be sensible. Now we're going to talk about feature service or, or SOS or whatever, but to have some basic grounding. Okay. I wanted to say that um, users of the validator too are very welcome to send an email and usually get, except this week, uh, immediate answer and any feedback is very welcome so <coughs> that it can be improved. Next. Thanks, Ilka. I think uh, Angelo forgot to mention he's the key developer of the validator, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I think he was very really carefully listening to what you were uh, uh, saying. Cathy, regarding the question, yes, definitely that's a must. We have a few decision trees. Uh, one is dealing uh, with, with, with the observation world. There's one in the uh, WCS uh, guidance, but uh, consolidating those, having an, like, like an entry point would be very, very uh, useful. And, uh, We've been uh, thinking about uh, proposing something, and it's on on, 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 it's on JRC to do. I don't think that re really requires a, a new technical guidance because we've got uh, quite a lot of those uh, already. But really, something like a visually, like maybe extension of what uh, Sylvan and James, the editor of the WCS, uh, were proposing to kind of have a bird's eye view and then dive into uh, your particular uh, topic uh, would would definitely be uh, useful. And uh, yeah. We will uh, think about how to do. Other comments, questions? Uh, it's the perfect time to ask, ask because many of the relevant people are actually in this room. Other question, which is sort of inspired by the discussion a bit earlier about what is really a data set when you're thinking in SOS. I mean, I admit I'm. I'm struggling badly with this because I do not come from the spatial world and for me, okay, I could, I could draw a line around objects which are linked together and say objects which are not linked are something else, but that's the only concept I could find for this. And what, what I've been seeing now that we really come to the implementation is we have a whole, route, a whole row of requirements which come from this total focus, we're going to be using a feature service for this. And I mean, I remember the first time I read a lot of these things, I thought, who spelled the OGC services wrong until I realized, oh, we're making them more neutral so we can use other ones. Could we, is there some possibility, Alex, I'm talking to you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> to somehow revisit some of these requirements and see, because I mean, it's also going with some discussions I've been having with various people. From what I've seen, there is no system out there right now which can really fulfill everything. We've got lots of systems, this can do this half, that can do that half, and there's some requirements which make sense, but one could solve the problem in a different manner. I mean, again, the one with the specific endpoints. <coughs> with SOS, it causes us serious problems. It's also causing us problems with open source feature service. I understand you need it. I mean, I've been trawling through open government data, you've got 100 metadata documents, they all refer to the same service, 
and you don't even there you don't even have standardized features, and I am based on my linguistic capability understanding the feature name. So that, that's also not good. But I mean, if we had a mention of the feature name in the metadata, the problem would also be solved, and it would solve a lot of implementation problems. So I'm really wondering if we shouldn't revisit some of the requirements, which made a lot of sense five years ago, but they, they don't make sense now. They're making our life very difficult, and we're all bending over backwards to fulfill requirements, which we, we, we could use this effort so much more sanely. <laughs> do you have, uh, Alex, do you have a quick comment before Sylvain? Uh, just backing the proposal, just backing up. Uh, it was really uh, it was difficult for me to write, to map the gate spatial data set to offering to a source because I mean, an observation and spatial data sets. I mean, sounds weird, at least to my brain. Do you have a comment, Alex? Yes, uh, Cathy, when I was listening to you, I was actually thinking that Sylvan would want to back what you're saying because we discovered quite a lot of things that uh, needed a change. There, there, the, the, this question has got two sides. Uh, uh, some of the requirements, as you, you know, come from the technical guidance documentation. That's fine, that those can be changed. Uh, there is a mechanism established, the subgroups. We've could have done quite a lot in that uh, direction. The, the others, however, require change of the legislation, which is uh, quite uh, difficult uh, to do. There is again a, a, a process put in place within this uh, refit mechanism, but when we want to change in the re legislation, we should uh, realistically see that this cannot happen overnight, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, it, it, there is a, this very difficult balance always, do we change because there is a new standard emerging, can we change legislation? We cannot do that every day. So it's really, we have to be very well thought and uh, have to be uh, forward looking, let's say, because uh, the balance between stability in an SDI and, and uh, going for the new stuff is really, really not not uh, straightforward uh, uh, to uh, answer. But I, I, when I was listening to you, I, I all also thought that it's actually a process, right? There's no, it's not a binary, I have 100% or I have nothing. So uh, it's, it's small steps and even if there is no um, one solution that can uh, be, be fit for all purposes, that can implement uh, all, all possible requirements, that, that's still fine, I, I think. If we, we go for what users really want, if we satisfy, their needs, uh, that, that's, the, the, the job is done, and uh, we are serving them, we're not serving, serving ourselves uh, as data uh, providers, uh, right? Problem is that usually we discuss among ourselves representing the provider side, maybe we should be listening a little bit more to uh, users, but that's uh, probably another, uh, another story. Our requirements, I think, is the community's requirements so that are Other questions on this topic before letting Kathy uh, run the show for the uh, combination of our SOS and FN, uh, what, uh, the web feature service? No? I'll just look for your presentation. Uh, I think it should be here, so I just have to find it. Where's the folder for the presentation? Thank you for the very good discussion. Uh, that was very useful, and I think I'm sure we get a lot of good uh, feedback for the for the process to make the 
technical guidance even better than it is today. So while we're waiting for the uh, for the slides, um, I have still one question that I would like to ask you about the technical guidance. Um, currently, the technical guidance is a kind of combination of uh, of a technical specification with exact requirements for a particular technology, and that is combined with some kind of best practice for the data providers. Do you think that's a good approach to have both in the same? document or would you rather have a separate technical specification and some kind of best practice on how to how to guide the data providers to to do what they need to do do you have, how do you use the existing technical guidance documents in your organizations do you think it's easy is it to use as a kind of combination document? Or do you need to extract the requirements for your technical people somehow from the, from the guidance? Can they use the existing documents as they are? Maybe that's a, something to consider. We can come back to this also in the second session in the discussion. Everybody talking, keep your presentation yeah. <laughs> in your pocket. Yeah, so some of the things that will probably be featured in, in Kathy's presentation is um, how should you use these technologies together kind of as a combination when you don't you, you can't necessarily use just one technical standard for for a functional entity. Sylvain, you have gone. I can speak now, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people start to realize how powerful it could be just to link one service to the other at instance, by at instance level, it's, it's really useful and it opens brains, I would say. Thank you. Welcome, Cathy. Okay, so for well, one of the things that's been, been keeping me busy the last years is, okay, I've been doing a lot of work with SOS and with the web feature service and how do these fit together and where is the line between? So, um, use this. Mm -hmm. Okay, which, 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 this was a very last minute presentation and I was just, okay, so you have data, you want to figure out how to serve it, if it's a spatial stuff, do your feature service, stay happy in your GIS world, everything is good. Oops, you have measurements. 
And then the question is, what, what, what do you really end up using? What's, what's our service? Then you, you can still ask, why, why, why bother with anything else? We've got our feature service, we're good at them, we're used to them, we're at home there. But if you have this type of measurement data, you're going to be missing a lot of information about it by the service. I mean, you, you can pack the observational data into a feature service, the O&M observation, all the data models are normal GML features. You can stuff them in the feature service, but in the capabilities, you're going to see you have observations. You don't know what type of observations, what is being observed, on what type of thing, with what method, all gone. And you're also missing various filter criteria when you're accessing the data, that you can only then get predefined blocks. Whoever has the data puts it into daily, weekly, monthly blocks. You can pull the whole block. You can't do a temporal filter and say, I want the data from last Thursday until now. So th these are the reasons why just a feature service probably isn't going to cut it for more complex data intensive applications. Then you still have the question, do we want the SOS or the web coverage service? So I took a bit of this from D29, the guidelines of saying, what is really the quality of my data and what, what about the data do I really want to know? And I mean, pa partially it has to do, is it really a spatial coverage? If you have something which is rastered or gridded across a country, you're probably going for a coverage service. The other criteria we came up with discussing this was saying, what is really the first class citizen of this whole observation result part? If you really just want the numbers and you don't care how they were gained, and that's, again, also on a gridded level, you're, you're probably best off with a coverage service. If you need to know how the measurement was done, you need the observation metadata, then you're gonna to have to go for an SOS. So. Now we've decided. There are various technologies available there. I've got a list of them. This is, I, get, I pulled this off the, the thematic cluster, what we've collected to date. You have to be careful, not all of them su support the, the current Inspire requirements, which will be, fi are they finalized? Okay, which have been finalized and we will read them soon, as soon as we can get them out of Alex. But there, there is various technology up there to support it. But now, now we're at the fine line, and this, this caused me nightmares for about a year, when at some point I realized that there's actually, there's quite a bit of data that, actually let me take another step back. You'll often have the situation that you've got various spatial features, those, it makes sense to serve with a feature service. People wanna put this on a map, they wanna have technology they can use for this. So the installations I've been doing, I've got all of the normal spatial stuff, I've got on a feature service, then I've got the, the real measurement stuff on the SOS, and then you've got this area of overlap. And this is information which is integrally a part of both views of it. So, I mean, it's, it's basically these three things we have here. The one is the, the object we're measuring on, what's called the feature of interest in, in SOS, O and M speak. The second is the measurement process. How did I do that? There's, again, a separate call for this in the SOS system, describe sensor, and the result itself. The, res the actual result, okay, that's clear in the SOS, but both the, the feature of interest, what you're measuring on, as well as also the, the methodology of this is also something which really pertains also to the spatial stuff. You have your monitoring station for your environmental media of choice. And when you, when you describe this, you wanna put this on the map and you wanna add the metadata, what's being done here. So this should logically be in the feature service. At the same time, it's integral data on how was this measurement done. So you want it in the SOS. And at the end of the day, the, the only sane solution I could come up with is you need to serve this overlapping part of the data via both services if you're going for this sort of, sort of solution. And then the question is, how do you do it? I mean, the first version is you have your native database with all of your source data, you have your feature service and your SOS directly con configured from there. That's probably going to be a mess to configure. I, 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 if somebody's braver than I am, they should. I, I go very much for the other solutions. But I mean, in, in, in this case, you at least know you're consistent. You have one data source and everything else is tacked on there. 
The second one is, at least from my experience, was probably gonna be the more common one and the one which allows you to sleep nights is basically then ha you have your source data and then you have for your various service solutions, you've got a database where you, you pull it over there, have it already in the right structure, serve from those. And so this, this is the solution we went for in the Austrian air quality reporting, or a similar one, actually it's gonna be the third one. But the problem here is now I've got two different data sources. Y yes, they're both derived from the same one, but we've all been working with databases long enough to know that at the latest in two years, there are gonna be inconsistencies between these two. And so you basically have the same results being accessed from two different services, giving you different information. And that, that is not good. So, that's why we then came up with the third solution. This was done in cooperation with the Austrian Institute of Technology with the new SOS server they, they implemented for the Austrian air quality reporting, where we said the, the actual measurement data comes directly from the source database. We've got a, a, a separate database for the, the feature service that, that gets pulled off on a regular basis, but so the source data is in, in, in the real database measurement data. But for all of the, the overlapping bit, for both the, the sensor information and the feature of interest, if, if you look at the XML that comes out, it's the same for both. It's the exact same encoding, the only difference is the wrapper. And so what we've done there is we've done this type of coupled services where we say the source data, which is really SOS, comes directly from the database. Everything else, when the SOS gets a request, describes sensor. It repackages this to a feature request to the feature service, gives me this, this procedure information, gets that information, rewraps it in an SOS response, and re returns that to the, to the, the client. Conclusions. To my view, SOS is a very viable solution for inspired download services, especially where you want to know how was this, this measurement really done. As with all Inspire download services, the devil is in the details. I mean, the, the requirement 52, a separate service per data set. We're just gonna say that all of the data in our data holdings is one data set. It's gonna be the only way out. There's quite a bit of more work required, but we're getting there and I'm curious where we'll be next year. Thank you. Questions for Kathy Slight from Datacov. I was interested in about the, uh, the thing that you you mentioned explicitly that you can't use web feature service for filtering by um, observation metadata. Do you have any? Um, I, w I wonder if you have a direct access web feature service, why couldn't you create a query where you can actually use the, if the data model is an OEDM data model in web feature service? You, you could do various stored query, or well, I'm not sure what the name is for the, the pre -def Stored query, that, that's one way, but uh, you could also do an ad hoc query, I suppose, uh, and you can use any length of, of path, X path, uh, expressions to actually filter by the any of the properties of the data model, right? That, that I can filter when I access it, but I, I don't see it in the capabilities. So I, I don't That's, even know what to look for. I can then say, okay, there are observations there and let me see if the observed property is something I know, but I, I can't even get back the select distinct of the observed properties to see, so I have to blindly fish and say, can, can you do this? Oh, you can't do that. How else could you call it? So that's basically groping in the dark. And what you definitely can't do is a temporal subsampling of time series. That's right. Other questions? This one here. Uh, can you go back to the slide when you, yeah, solution three, I guess. Uh, yeah. Why do you need to rewrap your response from the WFS within the source? I mean, if you just, and that's interesting because uh, that's one presentation Michael will do here in the second session. We have 
it's more or less resemble what we designed within our uh, groundwater level, uh, let's say, information system, trying to be compliant, to inspire, but we just link the services using URIs, URIs that are based on unique identifier that we properly manage within databases. So why do you need to rewrap? Basically, where you do get feature of interest, you say your feature is here, resource.brgm.blah, blah, blah, X, and your client, if he wants to know more, he, he just uh, needs to resolve that. So, so your approach will be just keep providing an X link to the feature and then letting the, the user access it directly from the, the feature service. Yeah, it's losing a bit uh, the dependencies between services. Otherwise, you can enter timeout be because your source could be in some place and your FS could be in another partner remote location you don't know, some other IT group you don't know as well. I like the idea of, but that's a different viewpoint, just uh, uh, explo exploding uh, each data piece like Lego, classical image we all have, in each piece of pieces of having its own identifier and you just link them via identifiers. But you'd, you'd still have to wrap that then in an SOS response. Because I mean, the, the protocol for SOS is clearly defined. If I get uh, a get feature of interest request in, I have to have an SOS response. Sure. The only sa the only saving would be, and I would still have to query the other service. Would be, then I would just put in a list of X links instead of the full feature information. Yeah, just G Gmail reference type you use in your. But I mean, I, I, I still need the, 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 the cross-coupling between the services because the SOS would still need to have a way of saying what, what are the feature services X-links. Sure. That's the only thing you need to know uh, within the source, the underlying uh, source database, actually. It's the identifier and the, yeah, you, you right of the feature you will be basically copy-pasting, let's say that, in the, in the source response. I mean, the problem is you, you then need a, a further request, so it's for the, sure. for the client, it's more work. And I mean, what, one reason I didn't even think of going there is also the, all the, the X-Link problematics of how do, we, how do we make really clean X-Links which are resolvable and persistent and getting the agency to set up a proper rewriter for this, I decided. That's what I was saying, <laughs> URIs is the missing piece in the puzzle in all the technical guidance we're producing. And we, that's a discussion we had together before. It's not written in the directive itself. I mean, the, the fact that the identifier should be, must, shall be a URI that resolves, it's not written because it, sh it shall not be. It's a should. So I often have the feeling that the really important bits got lost in the requirements and we're right now trying to fulfill requirements, which, okay. But I th yeah. Peter. Thank you. Peter Baum speaking. <clears throat> I was surprised by this distinction that you did uh, between SOS and WCS saying, uh, are you interested in the observation or in the result? Then I thought about it and said, hey, that makes sense. My personal way of explaining the difference was always that SOS is more upstream. It allows to capture all the sensor data coming from anywhere, whereas the W something S's are for downstream delivery. And I feel like this makes sense. This goes together well. So uh, when I interpret what you said with interested in the results, it might also be interesting to look at the functionality. What do you want to offer to your clients? Uh, is that something uh, like, for example, you have some uh, imagery or ele elevation data? Subsetting, of course. Temporal selection you mentioned. Do I want to extract uh, rain, um, elements from hyperspectral imagery, CRS reprojection analytics, and maintenance of uh, the coverages on the server? So the question is, is that something that we want? And that would be some sort of refinement of exactly what you said. So I believe you've made a good point here. Okay, so we can, we can use our, our decision tree, which we started for the SOS stuff, for the, the bigger sorting out what, what service to go for, which I was complaining to Alex earlier that separate, separate guidance documents for the various download services, but could, couldn't we really just have one repeated chapter in all of it? There's so many repeated chapters in all of these documents. I mean, I, I automatically flip through the first 50 pages until I hit the meat. So put, put it there for the people who don't know to flip through the first 50 pages and they might learn something. Yeah, for people who are not very familiar with the technical guidance documents, there are sections which are on a darker background, which are uh, repeating in many of the do documents uh, in exactly the same way, and the way they are, the, the meaning is exactly that you don't have to go from document to document to document to actually find this information. 
it's been embedded in some of these documentations. When, so when you're reading the technical guidance documents and there's a, a text or a couple of uh, pages um, in a darker background, it means that is, it's the same, for example, in each of the data specification documents. I think it's a good idea, Kathy. Thank you. Any more questions about that? Any more questions on general about the technical guidance that you want to ask here? Or about the Inspire implementation rules, how they map into the technical guidance? If not, then um, um, welcome back to the second part of the session in half an hour. We have uh, presentations from about the web coverage service um, profile or the, the group from by, by Yare Reini. Then we have a um, presentation about the web feature service and web coverage service implementations uh, of, about meteorological data from Finnish Meteorological Institute, very interesting. And then we have uh, another use case from BRGM from about the using web feature service and combining that with SOS. And then we have another uh, uh, discussion session at the end of the, that session, though. Discussion about how the use cases uh, work, if there's some problem still in the documentation, uh, which data sets should match into which uh, download service technologies, should you use these combinations or sometimes these combinations making things even more complicated. And there's, uh, there's uh, sure to be some gaps when you kind of combine different uh, technologies as already mentioned in here. So it doesn't, it's not always straightforward. So uh, thanks for the session and welcome back in half an hour. Is there an internet action here or is this? Oh, yes, this one. Esto es H2, ¿no? H1. There's nothing so far. But you know, we need to have your presentation on the main room. Sure, sure. What are you going to do?